but let's talk about ads and advertising revenue. If you're capable of watching this video, you've probably gotten sick of ads or commercials at some point in your life. Uh, there may even be ads on this video, which is not my intention. But you've probably asked yourself at some point, well, why am I wasting my life watching these ads? And there's nothing worse than when someone sticks their phone in front of your face to show you something, only to have to watch an ad first. Or when someone plugs in the aux cable and an ad comes on before the music. But for some reason it's different when it's your own phone though, right? You're just more likely to justify the lost time. Now, my goal by the end of this video is to convince you, or rather to empower you, to take control over the growing number of ads we see in our day-to-day -day lives. But beyond that, I'm going to present a few different phenomena that are occurring with ad revenue that you may not have considered. And it's those phenomena which are essentially going to empower you to take control of the ads in your life, and by extension, in society. So, what is ad revenue? Well, simple answer, ad revenue is revenue earned from advertisements. But what exactly is the purpose of the ads? Well, you purchase advertising space in order to persuade potential customers to buy your product or service. The purpose of advertising and marketing in general is to increase sales revenue. In other words, advertisements sell you the idea of a product or service in hopes of selling you the actual product or service. The value of advertising is definitely real, otherwise we wouldn't have companies like Google, Twitter, and Facebook, where a respective 80, 90, and 97% of their revenue come from ad revenue. So we can say with certainty that ideas themselves can be very valuable. But how exactly do these companies get so many eyeballs to earn all this ad revenue? Well, they are platforms that conglomerate content, right? Users upload and share content, whether it be music, videos, or even just public conversations. The source of the content is creators, who can be users themselves. Now, creators aren't always users, right? But they often are. And then the other employees basically create and maintain the software that manages the content and advertisements. So, who in this scenario deserves the lion's share of the ad revenue? Well, obviously the biggest creators should make the most, right? They are the ones creating the content, after all. So, why are the executives shaving off more of the ad revenue than the biggest creators are? What value are these executives bringing to the table? It seems to me you only need the creators, the programmers, technicians and engineers, customer service, a couple admins, and a janitor. I mean, bottom line, many of these large companies are not distributing ad revenue in a manner I personally agree with, and I refuse to contribute to the wealth inequality that results from the poor allocation of that revenue. So my solution to this poor allocation of revenue is to use ad block, okay, all the time, no matter what. And my suggestion to you is to do the same. And whatever you have to do to get ad block on all the devices you use, I encourage you to do it. And fair warning, I'm not here to give you a tutorial on that, but why ad block? Well, the reason these companies are so good at acquiring ad revenue is because they know you very well. The data they have on you makes for very valuable, well-targeted ads. And people will pay a lot f for access to that data or even just targeted ads themselves. So let's consider the effect that ad block will have on the value of the ads. Well, the only logical conclusion is that by lowering the number of ads that actually reach the end user, you directly lower the value of the ads, and by extension, you lower the value of your personal data. And in lockstep with that, you lower the revenue of these companies as the people buying advertising space adjust to the decrease in the value of that ad space. The end result is that the entire market for advertising space shrinks. As these corporations adjust to the shrinking number of ads that reach end users, they simply purchase less ad space. It's literally in the hands of the public to remove ads from their lives. Ads are only given value because we choose to tolerate them. Emphasis on the fact that it is a choice, okay, at least for these pre-roll ads in media. Now, 
ad block won't obviously get all of the ads, especially in the smartphone apps that these media platforms use. Nor is it wise to downsize large companies like Google and Facebook too quickly. If this video got 8 billion views overnight and all the ad revenue stopped tomorrow, it would destroy the economy. But never fear, that won't happen. Okay, But the truth is, we do need to downsize these companies in a slow and controlled manner. Okay, Elon Musk already downsized Twitter. And it's time for all these other bloated companies to downsize too. Unless, of course, you support the way these companies use your data. I mean, that's a personal question you have to ask yourself. And then there's obviously the question about the content creators. How will they get paid well enough to fund their content and beyond if they don't receive any ad revenue? Well, if I can convince you that watching ads is a waste of human life, then maybe you'll be conscious enough to also consider donating directly to the particular content creators that you like. Instead of watching ads, save your time and pay the creator directly. You're then free to spend the time you saved making more money elsewhere, if necessary. And I'll add that you shouldn't be stupid with your money either. You don't need to donate to some retired millionaire YouTuber if you're broke. Make an honest assessment of who both deserves and needs your money the most. Too much unfulfilled need is bad for everyone in the long term, including your own needs. This is just a fact of nature. It's it's the nature of inequality. If you can't afford to support creators financially, then do so by word of mouth. Okay, Money isn't the only thing that talks. Your words still do have power, whether you believe that or not. And the point isn't to say that these conglomerates provide no value at all. They absolutely do. But again, why are our executives making anything close to the biggest content creators? In, in addition to your data that these companies use for profit, what is the implication when these large publicly traded companies that platform much of our communication primarily function on ad revenue? Well, it seems to me that these companies would want to maximize interaction. Okay, They would want to maximize ad impressions and ultimately maximize ad revenue. And what is one type of content that is great at getting clicks? Well obviously controversial content okay it, it's not even to say that these companies are trying to divide the public but in all likelihood they turned the algorithm to ai mode and the ad revenue started flying in with the side effect of feeding humanity's nature for controversy and the end result of that somehow comes down to a supposedly educated population narrowing down the best presidential candidates to donald trump and joe biden Okay, we are an educated population, but education doesn't mean we are intelligent. It just means that someone put some kind of information into our brains to form our perception of reality. The term education doesn't imply anything about the quality of that information. And to ask you a few personal questions that you can think about to yourself. Are you smart enough to decide what to buy without ads, or are you not? Okay, do, do you have respect for your own time or do you not? Are you smart enough to raise your own children or do YouTube and Facebook have to censor the hostile world out of their life for you? Now, I realize that Adblock isn't the perfect solution, right? The perfect solution would obviously involve putting me in charge of everything. But since that's not going to happen, I'll just try to convince you to take charge yourself. Okay, so even though you can usually pay content creators directly... You can't really donate to the programmers and customer service reps that keep these platforms running smoothly, right? So, there is an alternative solution to using Adblock that will allow you to contribute to these people that isn't so heartless, right? And I'll just call it using Adblock consciously, okay? In other words, just selectively use Adblock. This way you can watch ads when you feel the ad revenue is going to the right people. And if you think the ad revenue is being poorly distributed, then block the ads, okay? Force these companies to properly compensate the value creators. And there's another factor you should consider when choosing which ads to block. You have to consider who the content creator is and what the purpose of their content is. It's very possible that the creators have similar motives to the media conglomerate platforms themselves. For example, YouTube and Facebook are happy to show you viewpoints from both CNN and Fox News. 
despite the fact that those are opposing viewpoints. Whereas CNN and Fox, on their own, will generally remain very partisan. But the motives of YouTube, Facebook, and these other mainstream media companies in general are the same at the end of the day. Okay, They platform controversial content so people will interact and bring in ad revenue. Again, the large majority of their business model is ad revenue. Fox and CNN are happy to show you their content on cable TV, YouTube, Facebook, and anywhere else you may find it because they make ad revenue either way. YouTube and Facebook are happy to show you Fox News and CNN because they make ad revenue either way. These companies only speak one language, and that language is profit maximization via ad revenue. And they're effectively bound by law to maximize that profit, and even if not by law, then by their shareholders and competition. So at this point, in order to come up with a more objective way to decide which ads you should block and which ones you should watch, I'm going to break these ads down by the type of content the ads are packaged with. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to identify which ad revenue is actually being allocated in a manner that is healthy for society as a whole. So to do so, I'm going to suggest that you focus more on who is getting the ad revenue rather than the content creator or the content of the ad itself. And oftentimes the content creator and the media platform split the ad revenue. And in that case, you would have to look at both parties. So as far as I can tell, there's two types of content you might find an advertisement on. Okay, content designed for entertainment and content designed for education. But remember, educational content is not synonymous with good information, okay? So let's split the educational content into two categories, okay? Content designed to tell you the truth in its entirety and content designed to manipulate, whether by telling lies or partial truths. The difference between these two types of content can be easily identified by simply looking for nuance, okay? Manipulative content cannot dive too deep into nuance or it will diminish its ability to manipulate. And manipulative content creators will be ripe with strict narratives while refusing to ask themselves tough questions, whereas truly educational content will thrive on the tough questions. Now, the lines we draw between these three categories are often pretty subjective, right? It's possible for content to both entertain and educate the viewer at the same time. And likewise, one person might consider politically charged content as honest education, and another might consider it manipulative lies, right? And in this case, again, I refer you to my previous suggestions to identify which educators are honest and which are being manipulative. So... Let's just come up with some examples of content that falls into each of these three categories. And for now, I'm going to ignore the subjectivity of the classifications and where there may be crossover. I'm just going to list the example twice. So for entertainment, what are some different types of uh, entertaining content that are out there? We have music, and we have movies, TV shows, documentaries, that sort of thing. We have comedy, we have podcasts, video games, and news. And if you have another example, feel free to list it in your head. But how about uh, educational content? And we're talking about the content that is actually trying to educate in an honest manner. Again, documentaries, just a little crossover with entertainment. News, again, and we could say comedic education. Uh, podcasts and even like lectures like this video so how about some examples of manipulative content okay that narrative driven content that often uh, won't tell you the whole truth or may even lie to you well obviously news stations often mainstream media news stations will uh, try to manipulate you and we could include things like uh, like documentaries and podcasts and lectures. Anything could potentially be manipulative, but the manner in which these other types of uh, content try to manipulate is usually related to 
recent events. It's usually using recent events to fear monger and support their points. So we'll just leave news as the only type of manipulative content for now. And now what I'm going to do is go back through the list and I'm just going to add which platforms predominantly provide which types of content. So who provides music? Well, you can get music in a lot of places. You can get it on YouTube, Spotify, the radio, Facebook. I mean, you can't really get it on MTV anymore. So how about uh, movies, TV shows, and documentaries? Again, YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, cable TV. There's other examples. Uh, how about uh, comedy? Again, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, uh, Netflix, Hulu, Facebook. You can get comedy almost anywhere. Podcasts. You can get podcasts on YouTube, Spotify, and various podcast platforms. Uh, video games, you, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook. News, you can get on YouTube, cable TV, Twitter, Facebook, a lot of places. So how about uh, educational documentaries? Again, YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, cable TV. Uh, educational news, you can find on YouTube, cable TV, Twitter, Facebook. Um, how about comedic education? Again, YouTube, cable TV, you can probably, uh, other social media platforms, Twitter, uh, TikTok, etc. Podcasts you can find on YouTube and Spotify largely and the other podcasting platforms and lectures you can find on YouTube, maybe, maybe a few other places, maybe cable TV and manipulative content, manipulative news is found on YouTube, Facebook, cable TV, Twitter, uh, even TikTok, social media platforms in general. So what we basically have now is a list of platforms that host content, okay? We have YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, we have cable TV, and you could name a few uh, providers, Spectrum, Charter, Cox, DirecTV. Uh, we have Spotify, maybe Pandora for music, uh, Netflix and Hulu, providing a lot of uh, TV shows and movies. And then you have the radio waves for music and talk shows. And then you have podcast hosting sites and apps and TikTok and any other social media sites or social media platforms I may have forgotten. Now, obviously, some of these platforms provide a larger variance of content than others. Okay, YouTube seemingly provides everything. Facebook and Twitter have their hands in a lot of content, too. But we basically have a list of media platforms. So I ask you now, look at this list of platforms and feel free to add to it if I missed one that you use often. And I want you to think carefully about the content creators you watch on these platforms. I, I want you to categorize the content you watch into the three categories we went through, okay? Into entertainment, education, and manipulative education. If the content you're watching falls into those first two categories, okay, if it's truly educating or entertaining you, feel free to watch those ads. Again, assuming that those platforms allocate their ad revenue fairly among their employees in a manner that you accept. So YouTube, for example, they roughly break even as a platform by itself, okay, Regardless of what Google or Alphabet's overall profits are, YouTube breaks about even. And that insinuates that YouTube probably pays its creators and other necessary employees well enough to operate, uh, censorship issues aside. So maybe you would personally justify watching ads on YouTube for entertaining and educational content. And remember, if the content creator you're watching has millions of dollars to their name and you're living paycheck to paycheck, I implore you, do not watch ads or pay those content creators, okay? Again, your money and your time is better spent invested in yourself, all right? The rest of society needs you to have education and entertainment as well, whether they know it or not, all right? It's an integral part of remaining a sane member of society that can provide value to others. So if you are not financially capable of contributing to the creators you like, then let the people who do have disposable income contribute to them, okay? As I said before, make a reasonable, honest judgment of both who deserves and needs your money, okay? And feel free to use word of mouth, again, to support the creators you like. 
And hell, I'll just say it, all right? I even encourage you to pirate the content you want to watch if the creators are that wealthy and you are that poor, okay? Hollywood doesn't need any more of your money to watch Lord of the Rings. Tolkien is dead anyway, okay? Who, who's using that money? His family? Do you think his family's well off enough at this point? There's nothing wrong with putting your foot down and refusing to make the wealth inequality worse in this world. In fact, many of the videos I create on this channel will heavily encourage what is ultimately the boycott solution, okay? Oftentimes, the boycott solution is the only one that actually works because the game is so rigged against you that you have to play dirty just to stay above water. I, keep in mind also that I'm not trying to encourage you to steal everything or to just watch movies all day. I'm asking you to make an honest assessment of your financial state and act accordingly. Don't go hungry because you were busy pirating movies, okay? That, that doesn't do you any good. I'm just saying that you shouldn't go hungry buying movies either. But what you should never, ever do is watch ads on content that is designed to manipulate you, all right? Uh, looking back at our list, the only type of content that is designed to do so in a dishonest manner is news, okay? Uh, namely, mainstream media. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you'll have content, other types of content that isn't necessarily news, that is manipulative. And even if that content is not directly covering news, it will often cite recent events in order to propagate fear and encourage a particular action. And an example of that would be like these financial gurus that will often try to instill fear in you. They'll point out a recent uh, movement in the market and they'll use it as evidence to uh, get you to invest in a certain investment bank or to invest in gold or, or some other manner in which you will be able to uh, weather the storm of the upcoming recession that they fear monger about. Again, this content is almost always manipulative. And the proof is often found in the financial interests of the gurus themselves. They probably have a stake in the investment banks or in the, the company selling gold. And oftentimes, the financial investment think tanks are practically advertising their own investments. And then the viewers drive up the value right before the gurus sell their shares. So even if you do support YouTube, there's no reason to watch YouTube ads before CNN or Fox News videos, right? It, YouTube will survive that loss in ad revenue. They'll absorb it, and hopefully Fox News and CNN won't. And there's this brings up an important distinction between a conglomerate like YouTube and the partisan news stations like Fox and CNN. The difference is that YouTube is happy no matter what you watch. If you search for wholesome and educational content, YouTube will deliver. In fact, YouTube will even recommend you that content if the algorithm sees that it's what you want. But YouTube will also likely recommend you the controversial content right alongside it, and you will be drawn in if you're not careful. You hold the keys to controlling or even destroying these divisive media platforms. All you have to do is be careful about which ads you watch, okay? Because it's ultimately those ads that are paying for much of the revenue of these companies that are trying to divide you, all right? We must remove the media conglomerates who wish to manipulate for ad revenue, okay? And we have to force them to break up or pay fairly, what happens if we don't exercise our power over these manipulative creators and media platforms? What happens if we let them manipulate us at will? Well, again, as I said before, the controversial content that these profit maximization algorithms lean towards, they are not necessarily dividing us consciously, but the divide and conquer strategies practically right and fund themselves when you combine ad revenue with profit maximization algorithms that are run by AI, all right? Humanity wants to solve its problems, but when you manipulate and corral humanity's collective perception into two opposing categories that are created due to these profit maximization algorithms, and then you demonize anyone that thinks outside of that box, you diminish the diversity of thought. You suppress new ideas and ultimately diminish progress. 
this kind of manipulation should be considered a crime against humanity. And then we have these individual investors, also known as fools, who will invest in these companies in order to profit from the downfall of societal progress. As an increasing amount of our communication occurs online, more and more people will fall into these narrow lanes of perception that these media platforms feed us in order to maximize their ad revenue. More and more people will accept censorship without understanding that the censorship is the catalyst of their problems. Now, not all these platforms get their ad revenue primarily from ads. Right? Netflix, Hulu, and the cable providers all have subscription services. Until recently, Netflix didn't even have an ad revenue stream. And some of these platforms also offer you a way to remove ads with a subscription as well. It's up to you to analyze your personal financial situation and spend your money accordingly. But to those people who do still watch cable TV, I have a question for you in particular. Why are you paying for a subscription and still tolerating commercials? Do you have any respect for your own time at all? I want you to think about that question, okay? Because what you're basically doing is you're paying for for cable TV and then you're turning around and paying again with your time to, as you watch these commercials. But to bring back the point I made earlier, the large majority of these companies don't actually create content, okay? They simply host content. With the exception of Netflix and Hulu, none of these platforms actually create their own content. They simply conglomerate it. So we need to ask a very important question here. How much value is being created by the conglomeration? These large companies that mostly run on ad revenue are raking in cash without actually making the content they depend on. And then they give that ad revenue to shareholders. In other words, the shareholders, anyone who can afford to buy the stock, are profiting off of the value that other people create. This isn't a problem in itself, okay? Shareholders provide capital so that these media platforms can grow. And by extension, the content creators can thrive and the companies can hire more people than they otherwise would have. This is how shareholder capital actually creates value. However... What happens when the day job of the shareholder becomes stock trading alongside an impoverished population that can't afford to invest? Well, let's think about this for a minute. If the day trader can now make a living trading stocks, that means they have acquired disposable income. It is this disposable income that the day trader invests, which then redirects some of the profits back to themselves. Meanwhile, we have actual laborers who are still working for the companies that the day traders are investing in, and they're living paycheck to paycheck. This is where the logic of the stock market and capitalism in general breaks down. This is proof that the day traders' disposable income has allowed them to take profits from the laborers at a disproportionate rate to their value input. After all, if wealth inequality is increasing and more necessary laborers are going homeless, then those laborers are not being compensated enough to sustain their necessary role in the workforce, the necessary role that keeps the economy running. So how did the day traders acquire the disposable income initially? Well, short of winning the lottery or theft, there are only two ways you acquire disposable income. The first way is that you inherit wealth, and the second way is that you created value in the past and you saved your money. In other words, in the absence of an inheritance, these day traders were either impoverished at one point themselves and they lived minimalistically and saved money from their past value creation, or they were well compensated for their past value creation and saved the money all the same. Those are the only two ways these people became wealthy enough to day trade without an inheritance. But how many people go from low-income households to millionaire day traders? The answer is not many. Now, obviously it happens, but this is the exception to the rule. On the other hand, the day trader who was well compensated for their past value creation is the rule. The well-compensated value creator is expected to become the wealthy day trader much more often than the impoverished value creator. 
However, both the impoverished value creator and the well-compensated value creator were creating value. It's not to say that an engineer doesn't create more value than a janitor, but should the engineer, or more likely the engineer's boss, be able to buy themselves into an early retirement only to day trade and leech off of the value creation of the impoverished janitor who is still working? The obvious answer is no. If the janitor is necessary and their compensation isn't even paying for a home to live in, then the economy is not going to be able to sustain itself. Again, this is a fundamental break in the logic of the stock market and capitalism itself. Some might call it end-stage capitalism. What is the implication if we allow wealth inequality and the accompanying labor exploitation to continue in this manner? Well, what we are seeing is the literal creation of a caste system where a few people were so well compensated, in fact overcompensated, for their value creation in the past that it has enabled them to make a living doing nothing. This will theoretically lead to generational wealth owned by a lucky few who never have to lift a finger. One way this manifests itself is through these investment banks that buy up all of the stock of these media conglomerates and other publicly traded companies. These investment banks are traded in the stock markets themselves. They are literally entire corporations designed to leech wealth from the laborers who are creating the current value. And again, even if they claim to exist to help grow the companies they invest in, the fact that the people actually still working are falling into homelessness is proof that the value of their labor is being stolen to the point of economic unsustainability. It's important to point out that it's possible to break out of generational poverty, but again, this is the exception to the rule. You cannot expect the exception to become the rule. And in that same light, the frequency of exceptions will diminish relative to the frequency of the rule. This is just the nature of logic in this instance when wealth inequality is increasing. Pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is perhaps a helpful tidbit for individual motivation, but... It doesn't mean it's going to overcome the overall rule that is increasingly suppressing the exception. So, to bring back the dichotomy between the janitor and the engineer, does the engineer deserve more compensation than the janitor just because they seem to provide more value through their skilled labor? You cannot answer that question honestly without considering the upbringing of both the janitor and the engineer. To give you an analogy here, say you're in a race to the top of a mountain. Does your opponent deserve to win just because they started halfway up the mountain while you started at the bottom? Obviously the answer is no. But life isn't fair, right? And, and that's what we tell ourselves to justify the labor exploitation that often benefits us. But let's consider what happens when you keep repeating this same race to the top of the mountain. Eventually, the people starting at the bottom are going to catch on. They're going to see what's happening. Eventually, they're going to just stop racing or perhaps look for ways to cheat. And I use cheat in quotes here, right? To extrapolate this concept back to economics, eventually people are just going to simply exit the labor force and find alternative means to live. Those alternative means could be theft, bartering, scavenging, or, or even falling victim to the many diseases of disparity that are out there. It's not a coincidence that crime and diseases of despair are on the rise. They are a function of the growing wealth inequality that stems from the exploitation of labor. There is absolutely nothing out there that can keep these people obligated to run in an increasingly rigged race over and over again. The proof of that is in the various revolutions we've seen throughout human history. If you are one of the people who is going around bitching about people not wanting to work anymore, I suggest you check your fucking privilege. What you're seeing here is the beginnings of a revolution, and you're too blinded by your own ego-filled blissful world to realize it. 
And if you are someone that did manage to break themselves out of poverty and you justify your greedy behaviors because of it, I don't really have anything nice to say to you either. There's this mentality in many Americans that makes them think they've earned everything they have, and their proof is that their grandparents came out of the Great Depression dirt poor, and they've since then managed to build comfortable livings. But with that mentality comes a huge dose of cognitive dissonance that blinds them from the fact that most of the wealth that's been acquired in this nation trickled down from corporations that exploited overseas labor. Now, this globalization topic is getting a bit out of the scope of this video. I mean, that's an entire video in itself. But it's important to point out that this labor exploitation is prevalent throughout. It's by no means isolated within the borders of a single nation. So let's go back and look at the cycle of value creation and the accompanying financial compensation as it occurs with this media and the accompanying ads. Content creators make valuable content that people watch. At this stage, all the profits go to the creator. But eventually, there's so much valuable content that we need a media platform to organize and manage all of it. This means you need engineers, programmers, technicians, uh, customer service reps. They're all needed to write the software and keep it running smoothly. These people deserve some of the growth in ad revenue because without them, the original content couldn't have reached as many eyeballs. Individual investors then see these media platforms and they decide they're worth investing in. These investors would like to see the company grow with the hopes of expanding the content and the jobs associated with it. And they hope to see a return on their investment again. However, they are not creating more value. All the value starts with the creators. These investors are simply creating a potential for more value, assuming that the creators oblige them. And the creators usually will oblige. After all, it benefits them to do so. If a comedian releases a Netflix special, investors will help that special reach more people. Once again, these shareholders receive a portion of the ad revenue brought in by the original value of the creators. So what happens when individuals make the leap from individual investments to the organization of investment banks? Is there really a difference between individual shareholders and investment banks? Well, the difference is twofold, right? Investment banks have both more money and they are more organized. So the only difference is the magnitude of organization of the investments and the magnitude of the investments themselves. But we have to look deeper into these differences to discover what they might enable. So what happens when the majority of a company is purchased by a few institutional shareholders, shareholders that are not individuals, well, they own the majority of the shares, and by extension, the majority of the company. So they now control how that company runs. They now control what content gets censored, what content gets pushed to viewers, and the distribution of the profits themselves. And again, because these institutional shareholders are so organized, they are very good at manipulating these companies to, to their will. Before you know it, a bunch of investment banks control all of the largest media platforms that are responsible for much of our communication. The very communication that we live and die by is being puppeteered for very short-term profit motives. Okay, profit motives that, that operate with high-frequency trading, right? With AI, again, these investment banks become the parasitic day trading leeches that are stealing all the value that the actual working employees are creating. And then they puppeteer the distribution of the profits and the wages. Now, obviously, there are very wealthy individual billionaires who might not necessarily be heavily invested into investment banks. And that doesn't mean they aren't problematic, but... The fact that we have entire corporations that are designed to leech wealth from the real value creators is just a sign of the times, just as the billionaires are. And they're existing right alongside the growing poverty, crime, and social strife. 
I mean, this is elementary math we're seeing here. We could put this problem in front of first graders, and even they would be able to identify that the wealth inequality is the problem. And most of the fools don't even realize what the end game is. Most are just investing in these divisive media conglomerates for the short-term profit without a thought in the world about what results from the increasing wealth inequality. And what results? Well, like I said, revolution eventually results, right? But what is the precursor to the revolution? What is the warning sign? Well, the warning sign is increasing authoritarianism. If you want to understand this process better, watch my video titled uh, The Nature of Authoritarianism. But in short, when you monetize division and fear, as much ad revenue does and the accompanying profit maximization algorithms, you encourage people to seek control over the people they fear. And this control manifests itself with authoritarian policies originating from both the left and right side of the political spectrum because the controversial content of the media is convincing them that their political opposition is the cause of their problems and fear. These manipulative media platforms are not going to tell you that they are creating division for profit. They're not going to tell you that the increasing wealth inequality that they are benefiting from is the true cause of the rising social strife. They're just going to propagate fear among the lower and middle class. Okay, it's not a coincidence that these two opposing sides of the political spectrum happen to align with the two opposing types of controversial content that these, these media conglomerates pushed out to you. Okay, it it's all comes back to the, this ad revenue maximization. All right, these companies do not care what happens to public perception as long as they are maximizing their profits. So to end this video, I'm going to summarize the phenomena that we observed with respect to ad revenue and the nature of ad revenue, right? Ad revenue makes up the lion's share of the revenue of these large media conglomerates, okay, these platforms. It is the only thing that allows these companies to control so much of your life. If you don't like what these platforms are doing with that ad revenue, you have both the ability and the responsibility to put an end to it. After all, if you were pro-life, would you donate to an abortion clinic? No. Then why are you watching their ads and contributing to their profits? You have the power to remove the ads from your life, and you should do so, okay? Why? Well, blocking these ads directly reduces the value and usage of your personal data, okay? Secondly, ad revenue is maximized when these media platforms push controversial content. So these media platforms are obligated to push that controversial content. And the end result of that controversy is that the public will be trained into two partisan mindsets that will ultimately diminish our ability to think freely and, by extension, diminish our ability to make progress. All right? We, we need people who are able to think outside of the box, okay? We, we cannot all be trained into two categories of thought. And lastly, sort of as an insurance policy to protect the controversial nature of these media platforms, the sheer size and organization of these wealthy investors has led to the creation of the most successful middlemen to ever walk the face of this planet. They are leeching value away from the real creators and increasing the wealth inequality in the process. And then, because they have control of these companies, they censor content that goes against their narrative in an attempt to further increase both controversy and ad revenue gains. Now, if you took all of these investment banks and spoke to the individuals that, that make them up, it's not to say that many of them wouldn't be supportive of the First Amendment. In fact, I expect many of them hate the censorship. But what they aren't very good at is putting their money where their mouth is. All right, they are the ones that are in control of these companies, and they are the ones who are driving the censorship 
whether it be the algorithms that they run or whether it be the AI, regardless of what it is, they are allowing the ad revenue to be maximized at the expense of free thought. We are systematically suppressing the breadth of new ideas. So uh, now I'm going to go over some of the solutions that I suggested in this video, all right? Again, never watch ads from content creators that are manipulative, okay? Otherwise, you are directly paying those, those content creators ad revenue in order to continue the manipulation and censorship, right? Th this encompasses the large majority of mainstream media and anyone independent who is pushing the same narratives as mainstream media. And... As I pointed out earlier, there are ways to tell manipulative content from content which is truly trying to educate you in an honest way, all right? You have to look for nuance in the in the viewpoints that are being given to you, okay? Manipulative content, again, cannot look at the nuance too deeply or it will not be able to manipulate you. Manipulative content creators will have strict narratives and they will f refuse to ask themselves tough questions. Whereas the truly educational content will thrive on the nuance and those tough questions, okay? And to add something I didn't mention before, manipulative content creators will often only communicate in one direction, okay? If you're actually listening to somebody that is trying to educate you, they will discuss questions you may have with them. You will be able to communicate back with them. In other words, educational content creators will allow for two-way communication, whereas the manipulative content creators will often only speak to you. If you're not able to challenge the source of your information directly, then there's a damn good chance they are being manipulative. So, what's another solution, okay? Well, again, we need to lean towards paying the content creators directly when possible. And I do mean directly, all right? Send them cash to their P.O. box if necessary, all right? Any online service you introduce between you and the final destination of your cash is introducing another middleman. I'm very serious about these boycotts, okay? Boycott the middlemen. These middlemen have taken control of what used to be a public square. When you sought entertainment and education in the past, you would be face-to-face -face with the entertainer or educator. You could pay them directly or thank them or whatever it may be. These media conglomerates have hijacked much of what served the purpose of a public square in the past. Not to say you still can't talk to people in public, but the technological advancements we've made have moved much of our entertainment, education, and communication in general to these media platforms. And we've handed over much of the profit from the value creation over to a bunch of middlemen that don't create any value themselves. And if I can't convince you to send money directly to the content creators, then selectively choose which ads you watch, again, based on merit and need, all right? You need to ask yourself, does the content creator both deserve the ad revenue, and will that ad revenue enable the content creator to serve society better than your time will enable you to serve society? Again, it's a question of need, okay? It's a question of where your time and money will be best spent to contribute to society. And by extension, it's even a question of responsibility. It is not responsible to contribute to that wealth inequality. It is not responsible to thrust yourself into poverty just so you can pay some millionaire for their content. The mentality of many capitalists is that too much financial despair is a function of a lack of individual financial responsibility. Now, this can be true, but only in rare circumstances, only in exceptional circumstances. In reality, the opposite is true. The opposite is the rule. It is actually too much financial security that is financially irresponsible. And ultimately... It's too much financial security that leads to the excess of financial despair elsewhere. 
after all, it's not the people in financial despair that are setting wages. I once heard an analogy that equated money to blood and the economy to the body. Unfortunately, I can't remember who I heard it from, so I can't give any credit. But in effect, blood needs to flow smoothly throughout the body for the body to function. Too much blood pulling in one place leads to blood clots. Blood clots lead to heart attacks and strokes. In the same light, money needs to be distributed evenly enough among the people in an economy, or the entire economy will stop working. This analogy is very valid in this case. It's valid to the logic of any system. Whatever is necessary to keep a system running must be present throughout the system in the appropriate quantity. An economy that fails to provide necessities to the people that exist in it will not exist for very long. And lastly, above all, do not be a sheep, okay? Respect your own time. Do not fall into behaviors that you know are bullshit just because everyone around you does. Think for yourself. Now that you've watched a 50-minute video that concludes by telling you to respect your own time... I beg you, please take it to heart, okay? And don't watch these ads. Consider this the anti-advertisement that purges ads from your existence, all right? As I stated earlier in this video, ads are selling you the idea of a product or service. Ideas have value. The list of ideas that will flow through your consciousness is finite. Do not let corporations dominate that very short list just because you were a sheep to the most ass-backward societal standards imaginable. You are better than that. Question these traditions that are leading us astray and come up with your own ideas to challenge them. God knows we need more of that these days, all right? I know you're still in there. Stop being a mindless consumer. Thank you for watching.